Sad day, first talker today. Let's give him a great big DEF CON welcome. Come on. Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Woo. All right. Hey, welcome, everybody. We're really appreciative. You know, I think it's wild um, just to think about how far DEF CON's come. We're at DEF CON 30. How insane is that? You look around, walking through the halls, there's marble, and this is just so interesting to see where we've come. So I think it's worth a second to just look around, see who's there, see how much we've grown and appreciate that, like, we have just begun to burn down all the shit that's wrong in this world and fix it with our hacker mind. So guys, give yourself a round of applause. Like that is important and you being here is part of that and we really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being with us, especially at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, which in DEF CON time is like three in the morning in the real world. So really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jeff. My friends call me Replicant. Um, I'm a pediatrician and an anesthesiologist, and I do some security research about clinical medicine and technology with this guy. I'm Christian uh, Demeth. Kawadi is my handle. Uh, I'm an emergency medicine physician and security researcher. Uh, and I'm Corey Doctorow. I've worked with the Electronic Frontier Foundation for 20 years in different capacities. I'm currently the uh, uh, special advisor. I write science fiction novels, and I'm on the computer science faculty at The Open University and the library science faculty at the University of North Carolina. Uh, so little known fact, Kwadi actually brought me to my first DEF CON, which I think was DEF CON 18 or 19, back when we were baby medical students. And I was thinking the other day about what has happened in medicine since then. I mean, it seems like the 10 plus years have gone by quickly, but in medicine, that's a lifetime. And there, there have been some incredible advances um, in some of the ways we used our technology to treat patients that we can really look at with two lenses, you know, a lens of promise for the future and the incredible achievements we can make, but also one of peril of a, a future in which we want to avoid um, really significant concerns and tensions with privacy and autonomy. Um, and so just to kind of give you a little bit of a consideration for that, you know, we have gene therapies now that treat diseases that were fatal to children when I was in my pediatric residency. And that's incredible. That's, that's incredible promise. Um, looking at it the other way though, if you don't have insurance, you got to pay half a million dollars a year to keep your, your kid alive, right? We're going to talk about artificial pancreas as incredible technology that hackers have pioneered that can help to improve your diabetic control and really increase your quality of life. Uh, but we can see a future where some people may be forced to use a black box that they don't fully understand, that collects data that they can't access, that depends on DRM shackled consumables that they need in order to continue to have it function. Um, or a future in which telemedicine is available to everybody and people can see a primary care provider and they can use personalized medicine to customize treatments for them. You know, you can see a flip side of that coin where private equity is buying up your primary care provider and Amazon's acquiring your doctor's offices and you're starting to get targeted ads based on the data they're mining from you. So I really want to explore those tensions today as we talk. And we thought no better a person to help us uh, talk about this than, you know, the activist, Corey Doctorow. So we're going to let Corey take it over for now. Give it oh, up for Corey. You. Give it up. Thank you all. So I want to talk about a group of people who uh, rely on med tech and also rely on modifying med tech and some of the ways that um, their own safety has been weaponized against them and some of the um, stuff that's come out that's made life better for people who rely on it. So I'm talking about people who use power wheelchairs, which are a significant part of the $50 billion durable medical equipment market. Uh, there's about 3 million Americans who use powered wheelchairs. Uh, it's the uh, complex rehab tech area of, of Medicare. And Medicare is pretty dysfunctional in this regard. They very narrowly interpreted their mandate. And so uh, if you use a power wheelchair and you rely on Medicare to provide it to you, Medicare will only give you an indoor powered wheelchair. Uh, although many of us like to leave our homes, uh, and they will also uh, refuse to cover any preventative maintenance. So this is a recipe for disaster. You have a chair that's being used in ways that it's not supposed to be used, and you can't perform preventative maintenance on it. Um, one problem of, of the way that Medicare procures these chairs is that they um, go to lowest bidders, and the way to generate a low bid is to have economies of scale. And so two private equity roll-ups, a company called New Motion and another company called National Seating and Mobility, have bought virtually all the other companies that make powered wheelchairs. So people who use powered wheelchairs buy from one of those two companies typically. And private equity firms, they have a, a common 
uh, playbook, which is to load up their acquisitions with a lot of debt and then squeeze them to service that debt. They pay themselves a special dividend on acquisition, and then to make, to make good on that uh, debt, they then have to squeeze them. One of the areas they've squeezed is by cutting uh, service. And so parts are billed at very high prices, and it takes a very long time to get serviced. So all of this was examined in detail in a report that came out this spring called uh, Stranded from the Public Interest Research Group, or PERG. Uh, Stranded found that 93% of, of the power wheelchair users they surveyed had had uh, a need for service in the last year. 62% of them had waited four weeks for that service, and 40% of, the, of them had waited seven or more weeks for service. And in, uh, seven or more, yeah, seven or more weeks, sorry, I thought that was months. No, seven or more weeks. And you have to understand that in some instances, this meant not only that you couldn't leave your home, but possibly that you couldn't leave your bed. So it makes it very hard to be, uh, have a family life, have a personal life, do shopping, maintain your job, and do all of these things. So the question is, why can't people who are s literally stuck in bed for seven weeks waiting for a part, why can't they just fix their own chairs? And partly that's because the part stream itself has been starved by the duopoly. So uh, in, in um, uh, Stranded, Perg uh, collected stories from people who use power wheelchairs about their problems getting parts and service. Uh, they found uh, multiple people reporting that uh, the $6 inner tube that their chair used cost $300 uh, in, in, as a Medicare build part, and that it would take six to eight weeks to procure. So you would have a, <clears throat> a flat for six to eight weeks while you waited uh, for your chair to get fixed. Uh, there is a, an instance of a $20 power button that literally turned on the chair that cost $500 and took four months. But even where people can get parts, and they do, they source them from eBay and they source them from Amazon. And there's one great story about a, a stability wheel that they were having trouble sourcing a, a couple. And then their son looked up and he was like, that's just a skateboard wheel. And show them how to buy like that wheel with cool like orange glitter and whatever. And they just replaced it, right? So they can sometimes, sometimes you can just fix your chair by going around this, treat, treating them as uh, damage and routing around them. But sometimes you get blocked by digital rights management. So these chairs use digital rights management to restrict access to their management consoles. That means that you can't get diagnostic information out of them. It also means that you can't make routine adjustments. So for example, uh, there's often a delay built into the steering mechanisms. Uh, as you get more proficient with your chair, you might want to reduce that delay. You can't do that on your own. Also, if you change the pressure in your tires for different terrain and you want to adjust the torque and the motor, that's also uh, uh, an alteration you need a security dongle for. So the good news is that Colorado in June passed the uh, HB 22-1031, the Consumer Right to Repair uh, Power Wheelchairs Act, uh, which substantially fixes a lot of these things. They did run up against a really important problem, though, which is that removing DRM is a felony under federal law. Section 12.1 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act provides for a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for providing a tool to bypass DRM. And so they couldn't authorize people who wanted to fix wheelchairs or who used wheelchairs or who used wheelchairs and wanted to fix wheelchairs. They couldn't authorize them to make or, or uh, provision each other with tools that would allow them to affect these repairs. So instead, they did an end run around it and they ordered the wheelchair companies to just provide the tools that would allow them to read out the diagnostics and so on. This is a, a good solution, but really it's not enough. And so I, I just want to finish by saying that Electronic Frontier Foundation, we're representing Matthew Green and Andrew Bunny Wang in a lawsuit to overturn Section 1201 of the DMCA. And, and, and finally to say that, you know, as I noted, there's some like deep structural problems that make it hard for people to use powered wheelchairs, right? They, they, there's the duopoly, there's Medicare only paying for indoor chairs and not supporting uh, preventative maintenance. And better repair doesn't solve any of those problems, but it does fix wheelchairs, right? And that in itself is something worth doing and we can walk and chew gum, we need to do both. That story, how many of people out here were surprised about that story? Have you guys experienced modern healthcare that raised your hand? Uh, raise your hand if you've been frustrated with the inefficiencies, the lack of communication, the broken insurance system. Yeah, okay. We can all relate with that, absolutely. As clinicians, we relate with that. And as patients ourselves, we do. Uh, we're going to transition a little bit to another very strong theme in modern medicine, which is just that we often are unaware 
of how the tools we use actually function. That's so Repl can take us away. So uh, my day job, I'm an anesthesiologist, and I somewhat facetiously say that I hack people's brains. So I turn, I turn you off, and somebody pokes you with a hot knife, and then I turn you back on again. Um, if it's a neurosurgery, we blow on it before we put it back in. But um, you know, it's widely accepted among our profession that it's, it's, it's less than ideal to wake up during surgery, right? And so um, one of the things that we use is a monitor that helps us, in addition to a couple of other uh, variables, kind of keep track on how deep a patient is under anesthesia. It's called the BIS monitor. We've used it for about the last 20 years. It has been the topic of thousands of academic papers that really investigate how anesthetics even work. So something that we're all very familiar with. And without getting too much in the weeds, this is a monitor, the name BIS is derived from how it works. It takes the electrical signals of the brain, the EEG, and it processes it to produce a unitless, dimensionless number that people can trend. So 20, you know, patients nice and deep under anesthesia. 80, they're about to wake up and sue you for malpractice. So, um, for a long time, that name BIS was derived because most people understood this is something that looks at what's called the bispectral index, which doesn't matter. It's just a way that you can analyze that EEG. Um, last year, a really awesome doc uh, at Harvard, Christopher Connor, reverse engineered these previously proprietary algorithms. So this is a black box nobody's ever really seen under the hood here. He reversed those algorithms and showed that actually this device isn't, mo isn't producing a bispectral index at all. It's looking at a completely different aspect of the EEG which is a little unusual because a lot of the research that we've based um, and used this monitor to conduct has operated under this base assumption that the manufacturer has never bothered to correct or operate. And it's kind of a little bit unfortunate because I think in situations like this when we're using these clinical devices without fully understanding where they're getting their information, how they're producing, and how we use it, we miss opportunities to innovate. We miss opportunities to be able to use these devices in different situations or to say that they may be less than ideal for a particular use context. And I just don't really understand uh, why we have to live in a paradigm where these things are so locked down and proprietary. And if this is a concern for clinical devices that are relatively reliable that we've used for the last 20 years, I'm even more worried about this coming tsunami of clinical AI ML algorithms. You know, if I had a Dogecoin for every Silicon Valley guy at a medical conference who said, I've got this AI algorithm that's gonna revolutionize the way you practice medicine and save you billions, I'd have like $4. <laughs> so Corey, like, why should we not lift our hands and welcome our new clinical AI overlords? So, I, I mean, I think that this is probably an audience that is uh, well up on all the different ways that ML can go very wrong. We have a, a whole village here at DEF CON where you can see people giving ML all kind of hallucinations and tricking it in lots of ways deliberately and accidentally. It sometimes has some weird failure modes. And of course, that's true of people, right? I, you know, people make mistakes, people have biases and so on, but there's one thing about uh, a number that's given to you by software that is, um, I think, more dangerous than a number that's given to you by human, which is the degree of trust we put into it. That if you take a process that would normally take someone uh, aback and have them say, wait a second, that, that can't be right, and you have a computer emit that as a precise number instead of as a kind of squishy judgment, you can empiricism wash your, your weird ideas and people go, oh, yeah, no, I guess algorithms can't be racist. There's no such thing as racist math, you know, to which I say, meet my friend the phrenologist, he'd like to measure your skull with his calipers. Um, so, you know, I think that, that when you combine the already difficult situation in which people often defer to medical professionals about things that are, uh, that they are uniquely situated to describe because they're part of their subjective response to their pathologies, and then you add a computer in the mix that says, no, everything is fine, it becomes very hard to imagine how patients are gonna be able to uh, exert autonom bodily autonomy and, and uh, autonomy over their care. And I did wanna add about that awesome paper about the BIS monitor that this audience, I think, will appreciate. The guy who reversed the BIS monitor, one of the ways that he was able to do this is by building an emulator, which turned out to be really easy because the core DSP in the BIS monitor is a TI DSP that's used widely in video game systems, so he could use MAME, which is just great. That's rad. Um, so we've talked about algorithmic bias and empiricism washing and how we're all kind of really aware that these um, algorithms can have bias unintentionally sometimes um, just basically, just sold solely based on the data that you put into it or the training set or the demographic uh, composition of the individuals that comprise it. 
But then it becomes even more concerning, and you know, a lot of this talk's talking about dystopian futures, when you consider adversarial machine learning. And so if you're not familiar with that, uh, I mean, many of you are, um, think about ways in which an intelligent adversary could attack machine learning algorithms to manipulate the outcome, right? They could attack classifications, they could attack training sets, uh, change what the ground truth is, and design an attack that manipulates the outcome of the algorithm. That could be done in a variety of really scary ways for a lot of really scary purposes. If it's to manipulate you into buying something, uh, you can see a financial motivation. In the healthcare space, you can imagine organizations, companies, entities doing that as to uh, compete with one another and make their particular AI algorithm less effective, for example. There are even some papers out there that are quite concerning where it's not necessarily the entire population that may be impacted by adversarial machine learning learning, but you can craft attacks that the outcome of that only impacts a certain group of people. Uh, terrifying implications there. And one of which that I'm going to have a little bit of a call to action. This whole talk is kind of a call to action, but of the people in the world that are best suited to understand the perils of this and be equipped to help defend the future of humanity in this, I think hackers are probably right there at the top, right? So two things. One, continue the transparency that we've talked about. This BIS monitor is an example about how we as hackers are generally in support of far more transparency, especially with these algorithms that touch every aspect of our life. And then also that we possess a unique skill set, one that can understand how um, malicious adversaries, you know, adversaries can attack these. Uh, we, how we can defend against them and how we can better secure the infrastructure that will then hopefully with the promise of a lot of this technology potentially give us huge insights into clinical care, right? Improved treatments, new medications that can completely um, do away with pathologies we never thought would be possible. And so that kind of peril uh, and promise, we need you out there to make sure that, that these things that would thwart that future, that promising future, don't come to fruition. So we're hopeful in that. Let's switch a little bit from the doom and gloom to flip the script and talk about uh, what happens when hackers pwn themselves and are actually able to take the initiative and innovate on some of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So as you probably know, one in 10 Americans has diabetes. 92 million Americans are pre-diabetic. And diabetes, while anyone can get it, is, is uh, disproportionately falls on, uh, on marginalized people. It's a disease of poverty. And so people who have diabetes are structurally uh, find it difficult to demand high quality care uh, and to push back against abusive practices by med tech firms. So in 2013, uh, some people with diabetes decided to do something about this. Two hackers, uh, Dana Lewis and John Kostek, took a continuous glu glucose monitor and uh, figured out a way to hook it up directly to uh, uh, a uh, di um, insulin pump and wrote an algorithm that monitored your blood sugar, tried to predict where it was going, and tried to dose you with insulin as you went along. And the closed loop pancreas, artificial pancreas, was born. Uh, they call themselves loopers, uh, and they gather on a platform called openaps.org. Um, a lot of the people who uh, built these tools early on were parents of young children. So my friend Sul Kaharo is a video game developer. He worked on uh, a bunch of Salarki games in the old days. Uh, his young son, uh, who was uh, two years old at the time, had just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and was in daycare. And the uh, people who worked at the daycare were very diligent and caring, but they weren't experts in managing diabetes. And so he wanted to be able to uh, oversee, partially automate, and correct, uh, and get uh, alerts on his son's um, uh, insulin levels, blood sugar levels. And so he became a, a core developer on, on the looping tools. Um, and you know, it, there's a lot of hacker overlap with this looping stuff, and it's one of these great examples of hackers helping uh, normies, uh, where the stuff that we build for ourselves ends up sort of leaking out into the rest of the world. And there's a reason that hackers want to build looping software, and it's not because they're too lazy to manage their blood sugar, it's because uh, doing a routine task perfectly all the time is why we have computers. Right? There's, there's a reason we replace all of our routine tasks as hackers with shell scripts. Like, do you remember when Unix systems used to ship without a pre-built cron job that rotated the log files and they would just crash every three days because no one could remember to rotate their log files? 
And, you know, replacing the routine things in your life with a shell script is especially important if when you screw it up, it's hard for you to think right. And if you screw up your blood sugar, it can impair your cognition. So we lost a dear friend last year. Uh, excuse me, I always get choked up at this point. But Dan Kaminsky died last year. He, was, uh, he had diabetes. Uh, he had management problems with it. He was in lockdown. He was isolated. Other people couldn't see what was going on. And you can see how even someone as brilliant as our pal Dan couldn't manage a routine task perfectly all the time and could experience a, a literally fatal cascading failure, which is why we love this stuff. So you have these hackers who are hacking hardware, hacking software, making their own algorithms. And to do this stuff, they need to rely entirely on jailbroken hard uh, hardware so they can affect these changes. So I'll bring it back to you guys. Yeah, I mean, a question that we very commonly get is, this sounds awesome. Why aren't more doctors uh, recommending these systems to their patients? Why aren't more patients coming and asking for this type of care? And we just want to kind of hit a, a little bit on some of the reasons why we need to do some more work. So the first is education. Um, again, these were not tools and technologies that exist even 10 years ago when we were training, let alone the endocrinologist who's been out in practice for 30 years, right? And even as widely adopted as these are in the hacker community, I think Loop, which is one of the biggest uh, platforms, has about 9,000 people using it, and there are 1.9 million type 1 diabetics. So we really have a lot of work to do to sort of raise awareness there. Doctors are, who learn about this are going to just inherently worry about its clinical efficacy and safety, you know, and put aside the fact that we give diabetics a vial of 100 units of insulin and tell them to go figure it out on their own, but people are going to say, oh, this, you know, can't they screw it up if they set this up themselves? And we're starting to just now get some really interesting data to support the efficacy of these uh, different types of devices. There's a really interesting uh, paper published last year by some folks at Stanford and Loop in Miami that was really unique in its design and kind of demonstrated the promise of decentralized clinical trials. They basically just found people who are signing up for Loop. So Loop is one of the systems. Um, and they said, hey, we're just going to pull some data from you if that's okay with you. Give us your baseline data. We're going to see how you do over the next six months. But we're not going to tell you how to use this tech. And all of the patients who were in this study had to, you know, work with the community, troubleshoot guidelines on their own. Um, so it was really not a very paternalistic platform to say you need to follow this protocol exactly. But the results were pretty incredible. Patients after using this um, closed-loop system were able to spend longer time in a normal blood sugar range. They were able to avoid really significant low blood sugar episodes, and there were no episodes of sort of the more feared complication, DKA. So really impressive technology um, that we're starting to see is efficacious and is pretty low risk that people can use. One thing I do want to kind of comment on some of these studies and in the population in general is that it does sort of tend to reflect some of the inequities that we previously discussed. So the 500 or so patients in this study, 90% of them were white. 85% of them were college educated or higher, 70% of them made more than $100,000 a year, and 95% had private insurance. So there's work for us as we continue to push some of these open source platforms to make sure that the inequity um, that pervades modern medicine and formal clinical trials doesn't persist in these spaces. Lastly, we'll just talk really quickly about this idea of risk. So in order to give something to a patient, you need to have a discussion with them. It's called informed consent. We talk about the risk. We talk about the benefits. We make sure that you understand those. Kwadi and I are working on developing this concept of a cyber-informed consent that we'd be happy to talk about with people if they're interested. But if your doctor is going to be giving you these connected technologies, we'd like to think that they should be able to have that kind of discussion about the potential risks. And there are risks that arise from the connected nature of the techniques. Yeah, I just wanted to just quickly pull the audience here. Like, who here has had gone into a hospital and had a procedure done and a doctor or someone else has gone to them and talked to them about the risk? Like, hey, you might have an infection or you lose blood or anything like that. Raise your hand. Okay, how many people out there have ever had someone talk to them about the risks to their privacy or security <laughs> of connected medical devices when they get them? Anyone? Yeah, that's a problem, right? But it's a problem in so many really interesting ways. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a problem because it's not the right thing that should happen, right? We should be informed of these things. Two, often you do not have a choice, right? What dictates what insulin pump you get when you're a diabetic isn't necessarily a free market thing where you can go and decide and look along all of them and say, this is the one I want because it's the one that protects my privacy the most or it's the one that has the greatest hardware features. You don't have those choices uh, in our modern healthcare system. It's an insurance thing. And the last thing I would say about cybersecurity and consent, I know cyber, God, I would, yeah, this, isn't, this isn't whiskey, but I'm not supposed to say that at DEF CON, but the other interesting thing is that the people telling you about the risks have no idea what the hell they're talking about. 
Like how many of your doctors could even articulate basic security and privacy concepts? So the people tasked with asking you to consent to this don't themselves understand it, don't talk to you about it, and there are structural reasons why that's a really hard nut to crack. And so changing that requires education, awareness, and a lot of other things. Um, we're gonna also talk about you know, the elephant in the room now, which is a lot of the features that the Looper community was able to accomplish with this technology were because the devices themselves were vulnerable. That is an interesting prospect, and I, I have a hypothesis here. I want to just do a little thought experiment in the audience because I think this is a, a unique composition. Who here would wear a vulnerable insulin pump, infusing insulin into their body, it has uh, Bluetooth connectivity with no authentication that you can change the settings off just by connecting to it. Who here would wear that device and uh, rely on it to take care of them every single day? Please raise your hand wide. I, yeah. I'm sorry? If it allowed you. To if it allowed you to do those feature sets. Forgive me. I put a little caveat on it. You, sh you can wear this device. It's vulnerable, but it allows you to have all those cool features that the Looper community uh, has made. Please raise your hand. Question. Yeah, so there's a question about like, is there a way to secure it and have all the feature sets? We're gonna get to that in a minute, but the question to the audience is, who would wear a vulnerable pump if it allowed you to have all these cool features that the Looper community is making? Raise your hand. Who here would never wear a vulnerable pump that uh, had no authentication, right? Well, so this is the elephant in the room. This is the, the seeming conflict between the Looper community and the security space, right? We've had multiple security researchers over the years discuss real vulnerabilities in these connected medical devices that pose really scary safety risks, not just to your privacy, but to your physiology, to your well-being. Um, the FDA, in my opinion, has done a fantastic job over the last 10 years of pushing device manufacturers to do the right thing about uh, security, right? They've done the post-market guidance. They have a pre-market guidance document that says, if you want to market a device in the United States, you have to be this tall on the, on the security side. You have to do these basic practices. And I will say this, the FDA also is the first to the podium to defend security researchers when device manufacturers try to take a shit on them, right? When device manufacturers tried to um, intimidate and or do less than desirable things for security researchers, you know, the FDA is at the podium defending this work. So, but they're tasked with the safety of medical devices, right? And so if there's an issue, if there's a vulnerability in a medical device, um, they might issue a recall. Then those devices are no longer going to be in the community for loopers to innovate on. Right? This is the seeming, seeming conflict. And one of the points of this talk was to try to say we want our cake and we want to eat it too. You know, what we should be doing instead of fighting between the Looper community against the FDA is instead using this as, a, um, as a, an example of a market failure. That consumers, patients, parents of type 1 diabetics want access to the data. They want better control over the technology that keeps them alive, and that's something that they demand and they deserve. Um, at the same time, we want secure medical devices that don't have hard-coded passwords. What we should be doing is pushing device manufacturers to do the right thing, and what we also don't want to do in this dystopian future is allow for documents like the pre-market guidance, recommendations that devices should be secure to be a reason medical device manufacturer site as to why they can't be open, why you can't have access to your own damn data because they'll say, oh, we can't expand the attack surface. Why don't we just challenge that paradigm and say, why don't you deploy better secure development practices, you know, retool your security infrastructure to be both open, transparent, allowing for our patients to have access to that data, and then far more defensible from a security posture. Is that, is that fair to say? Is that the best thing we could do? Yeah? Well, we need you to out there telling people that it should happen.
So I want to close this out by, by uh, talking about how this all interacts with cyber law and the stuff EFF, EFF does and competition. So med tech companies don't like that patients are jailbreaking their devices and they use laws like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to take down software that allows you to change your firmware. It might allow you to change your firmware to make it more vulnerable. It also might allow you to change your firmware to make it more secure. So for example, Abbott Labs got GitHub to take down LibreLink, which was uh, software for the Libre2 uh, glucose monitor in 2019, citing uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And they argued that this was about patient safety, but a thing that is a common motif in med tech research, especially around medical implants and especially around medical implants for people with diabetes, is that firms do not respond to, in a timely fashion or sometimes at all to really significant vulnerability disclosures about their products when they're not being used by loopers to give themselves a better healthcare experience. So for example, uh, in 2019, um, a couple of hackers, uh, Billy Rios and Jonathan Butts, uh, did a, re a responsible disclosure to Medtronic to tell them that their mini med paradigm pump was super vulnerable. And they sat on that vuln for two years. And then last year, a black hat uh, the researchers who revealed the Vuln uh, released a proof of concept called uh, a universal remote for killing people. And that's what actually got Medtronic to take action. So this is a, a pattern that's repeated across all the major hardware vendors, including companies like Johnson & Johnson. This track record of foot dragging when there are issues that are live threats to patients, but leaping to action when there's a live threat to profits. Uh, in the shareholder communications that these firms make, they're pretty blatant about what they want to do. They want to build closed ecosystems for closed loops, where you have a single vendor providing the algorithm, the uh, glucose monitor, the pump, and, and sometimes they talk about <clears throat> proprietary consumables, right? either proprietary formulations or proprietary packaging for the formulations. Basically, they want to turn your artificial pancreas into an inkjet printer. And, and use all the printer tactics that um, we have historically seen in the printer world. And this has triggered a, an absolute inferno of mer mergers and uh, acquisitions activity as private equity companies see a lot of potential upside from building these closed ecosystems. And the closed ecosystems beget more closed ecosystems. So there's a great advocate for this stuff, a woman who calls herself the savvy diabetic. Her name is Joanne Milo. And in June, she sent a letter to the FDA objecting to the merger of a, of a glucose monitor company called Dexcom with a pump company called Insulet. Um, and although this was super anti-competitive, uh, there's a reason Dexcom was doing it, which is that Medtronic had bought another uh, 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 insulin pump company and locked out Dexcom. They did that with a company called uh, a Companion. And, they all, and Tandem had also blocked them. So here you have this company that makes the glucose monitor and is watching all the insulin pumps get bought up by other glucose monitor companies and locked down. So they're like, we have to have an insulin company too. We have, an, have to an, an insulin pump company too. But for all that they're the victim in this, they're also a terrible company with a long history of threatening their patients when the patients take actions to try and come out uh, and, and extract their data. So none of these firms have their patients' backs all the time. And uh, if we allow them to merge and create these closed ecosystems, it comes at the expense of patients who have idiosyncratic problems with their health that they want to resolve by mixing and matching pumps and algorithms, consumables and, uh, and monitors. It also harms them in, in that it makes the supply chain brittle because if your pump only works with one uh, glucose monitor and that glucose monitor can't be found because of a supply chain problem, then your whole pump breaks down. You know, we saw what single sourcing vendors did during the pandemic and after the pandemic with things like the baby formula shortage. So it is true when these firms say patients might harm themselves by modifying their devices, it is true. And it is true when their security researchers and their security staff say, we are only locking these down because we want to help our patients. It's true that that's a thing that they do. And it's something that comes up a lot when I speak at, at DEF CON and in other hacker forums about competition more broadly. I work on the competition team at EFF and we're talking about dismantling big tech and letting smaller firms enter the market. And, and oftentimes I'll speak at an, an event like this and someone will come up and say, you have no idea the eye-wateringly terrible stuff I block every day in my job at Apple or Facebook or Google. And they're absolutely telling the truth. But the thing that they need to recognize, that we all need to recognize, is your boss will pay you to defend me from his enemies, 
your boss is never going to pay you to defend me from your boss. Right? And this is why ultimately, if we're going to have an arbiter that decides what mods are safe and which ones aren't, it can't be the manufacturers. We do, there's a role for the FDA to show up and say, no, don't do that, you'll kill yourself. But if we rely on the manufacturers to do it, sometimes they'll be sincere, and sometimes they'll be talking out of their ass, and what they really mean is, don't do that or you're going to spook our shareholders. And we shouldn't have to figure out which one they mean. We should have access to a democratically accountable system that tells us what the truth is. Can we just clap on that? <laughs> on that note, we have a little less than 10 minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, we'd love to get a couple of those out of the way. We've got a mic back there. Uh, folks are able to get in line. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for coming out. You talk about these acquisitions, and why isn't the FTC getting involved antitrust? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know what? I got good news for you about that. So the FTC for 40 years took a nap. Uh, the, the official doctrine on antitrust enforcement in America and most of the world for 40 years has been something called consumer welfare, which uh, basically ignored all monopoly problems and allowed, for example, Microsoft to uh, corner 95% of the OS market and, you know, lots and lots of mergers. Two companies make all the beer in the world. There's one professional wrestling league. All the glasses are made by the company that makes all the frames and owns all the retailers. Like, it's terrible. But... Five years ago, a law student named Lena Kahn published a, an astoundingly good Yale Law Review paper called Amazon's Antitrust Paradox that demolished the arguments for antitrust forbearance. Today, that law student of five years ago is the chairwoman of the FTC. She has promulgated amazing new guidelines to block future mergers, and she's just announced antitrust scrutiny of privacy practices by firms, bypassing the deadlock in Congress and promising to regulate firms on privacy directly through the administrative branch. She is a hero. She needs our support. There is a public listening session on September the 8th that the FTC is holding on privacy. You can go and intervene. Your position as technologist is really going to make a difference. We are in a moment in which we are, have better news on antitrust than we have had since I was 10 years old. I cannot overstate how fucking great the antitrust picture is right now. It is amazeballs. I, I have a question about trust. As uh, somebody who lives and breathes this as a BiPAP user... Closer to um, the mic, please. Hi. Um, as a BiPAP user, what you've been describing as sort of the dystopian future is already kind of reality for me. Uh, Philips Respironics has been killing people knowingly for years and it took them three years to actually recall their products. Similarly, ResMed, if you don't pay them enough, they're not going to tell you that you have changed Stokes breathing, even though it's just a bit flip that you need to do all that. How can we actually have trust in the medical institutions today? That's a really good question. Um, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And Corey, I mean, why, why is this black box proprietary aspect to some of these things seen as like a competitive business practice? Why is there this Ouroboros between, oh, if we can't keep these things secret, we can't innovate? So I think the problem is, again, in antitrust. I think that when you have an industry dominated by like five firms, if they all settle on the same convenient bullshit, like if I told you about it, I'd have to kill you, no one who's credible, which is to say no one who works for a comparably sized firm, steps up and says, no, 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 wait, that's nonsense. Uh, we absolutely can share this information with people. Um, not only that, but when firms are very concentrated, they have a lot of money to spend on lobbying. So the way I think that you get good regulation is by making sure that firms are neither too big to fail nor too big to jail. You know, people looked at that photo of Donald Trump at the top of Trump Tower with all the people who run all the tech companies around a table in 2016 and said, isn't that terrible that they're meeting with Donald Trump. And I'm like, you know what's really terrible? That they fit around one goddamn table, right? Because if they can fit around a table, they will sit around a table. And when they sit around the table, they're going to figure out how to screw us. And so this is why as a prerequisite, it's not enough, but it is, a net, uh, it is a, an absolute prerequisite for good regulation. Firms ha uh, sectors have to be diverse with firms who will blow the whistle on each other when they're telling convenient commercial lies. So quick, I saw the five minute mark, so I'll try to make this quick. I have one of the uh, Abbott Freedom, or uh, Libra, uh, whatever the hell it's called. Uh, it's Gen 1. It's NFC only. And your question about would I trust this with, I don't, I don't need insulin, thank God, yet. 
but there's a Gen 2 with Bluetooth, I'm not getting that. So that's, I, I have to upload my data to the cloud as a necessity to inform my doctor. Also, I had to advocate myself to get this. And then I was gonna pay out of pocket, it just happens to be on my uh, insurance. So I'm very lucky, I'm, I'm very privileged to have insurance. So that's kind of where we're at with uh, uh, diabetics in general. It's, yeah. yeah that was my, uh, I, had, I had another question, but I don't think there's enough time, so I'll let other people go. Thank you all. I, I think that you know, one of the things all firmware can do is let you disable the Bluetooth on your device. And that's one of the things, one of the reasons that we should support all firmware. Real quick addendum. Also, uh, the other thing that I could have done with that hacked uh, firmware is not have to replace this every two weeks. Right. I'm fortunate that I have uh, good health insurance. However, my insurance dictates what devices I can use. So I'm wondering if you have any con comments on where the insurance companies fit in all of this. And if you follow the money, there's quite a bit of money in the medical insurance business. That's a really great question uh, and comment. And I'm, I mean, I'm sorry um, that you're in the position of so many other people, which is you may want to select a device for a particular reason, but you can't because of your insurance. You know, one of the interesting arguments I've heard or opportunities is to talk about how these devices pose risks to some of those payers. And what am I talking about? Health insurance is going to care if they have to spend more money on you. They also care how much the devices are that they have to spend to treat your illness. And so if we can talk about uh, risks to privacy, risks to security, and what the ultimate outcome of that would be from their bottom line, it may be a persuasive argument. They also are very commonly looking for reasons to, um, to try to save a buck. And so as these things become more and more connected, as these devices uh, and there are more and more vulnerabilities found in the wild, their recalls can be quite costly. That will eventually hit insurance uh, companies' bottom lines. And I could see them in the future doing a risk calculation to say, well, this pump might cost 50 bucks more than this other, but it's more durable, it's more secure, we're having less headaches with this. And so more and more as we can, they themselves can realize that, I think we'll move in a better direction. But also, you as a patient should let them know. That, that is really important. Being a voice and advocate for choice and of that choice, privacy and security being part of that is very persuasive to the people that regulate insurance companies as well. And so my, my it's going to be a long haul keep going, but raise your voice in that uh, so that we can change that dynamic. And then also just try to advocate broadly so that it isn't so stark a contrast between device manufacturers. Really we want to raise the entire device uh, ecosystem into their security and privacy. Um, that would help all people across all types of insurance. Yeah, we, d we don't want to create a market where like if you're lucky your insurance lets you eat in the restaurant where they're forced to wash their hands after using the toilet but otherwise they don't. We just want to eliminate the restaurants where they cook your food without washing your hands, uh, without washing their hands, right? Like that's, that's what we actually want. We just want to abolish the bad devices. What an advertising uh, metaphor to end on. Um, we got 90 seconds before we turn into a pumpkin, so I don't want someone to ask a great question that we can't answer. So uh, thank you guys so much for coming. We're gonna head over here. Anybody in line who wants to come and find us, we'd be happy to talk outside. Really appreciate everyone coming. Have a great con. Stay I'll be at the EFF booth later as well.